All right. Well, good morning. Can you believe it? It's like here already. I, I swear we just put these decorations away. But here they are again. And first of all, I'm going to say to, to all the wonderful people who helped us decorate our sanctuary and for your, yay, beautiful job. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think our church cleans up so nicely, don't you? It's just, it's just beautiful. It just thrills me. Um, today, my topic is prayed up and shopped out. And, uh, and I'm not uh, one to go out and do uh, lots of shopping in the world. I, it, it, I had this huge revelation years ago that I hate malls. I'm sorry, I know that sounds very un-American, but I just don't like going to the mall. I caved on Friday, I want you to know. I did go to a mall, I went to two stores, one I just ran through uh, to get to the second store, where I went and bought myself a lovely shirt. Um, <laughs> But I didn't buy anything for anybody else. It was, just, it was just too much. It was too much. I said, I will do this at home in a consciousness of peace with a laptop. It just works so much better. Um, you know, in the science of mind, uh, we teach that our inner world, what's happening inside of us on an ongoing basis, is cause to our outer world. That we actually have full control of our consciousness of cause. Uh, we have the freedom uh, of both our thought and our action. And I think just to recognize that is tremendous, that I have the freedom to think what I want, I have the freedom to act the way I want. Knowing, of course, as students of the science of mind, that all of my thinking and all of my acting has repercussions. There are just consequences for all of it. But this is how we are made in the image and likeness of God. We have the capacity for the ideal, and the ideal is that we think what we want, and we want what we think. I mean, that's what's ideal, right? That would be the best case scenario, that I'm thinking the things I want to be thinking, right? that that would be really, really good for me, and I want the things that I'm thinking as well. So this means I think that I have to stop myself if I don't like what I'm thinking, if I don't like what I'm doing, if I don't like what I'm imagining for myself or for anybody else or for the world. I have to learn to be able to stop that. Right? Why? Because our thought is creative, and if we continue to think if we continue to think, it will produce what we focus on most intensely. It will produce that in our experience. We are putting those causes into motion. This is what we do all the time. And we're going to produce those corresponding effects. I was thinking about Christmas when I was growing up. And I was thinking about what are my favorite, favorite memories of Christmas. So I have to say the first one is that when I was, when I was young, and my grandmother was still alive, we would always have Christmas Eve at our house. Our house was the gathering for all of the aunts and uncles and grandparents and extended family. And it was because my mother was a good cook. And so everybody came to our house because they knew all hell could break loose, but at least the food would be good. Okay? <laughs> so that was, that was important. And what I remember is after we would have, and, and this was a very Italian thing, on Christmas Eve, we would have uh, all fish, all fish dishes. Um, I don't know that there was really any religious significance to that or anything. I think it was just the tradition. And, and especially when my grandmother was alive, because when grandma was alive, when Nani was alive, we did the traditions big time. And um, I remember her in the kitchen with my mother and my mother's sisters, and they'd all be trying to get around the stove and cook. And you know, the funny thing was, my grandmother was also a great cook, uh, but she, um, she never read a recipe in her life that everything she knew how to do was here. And I remember as she got older, my mother, my grandmother would like reach into the flour and my mother would go, wait, wait, wait. And she'd put it on a piece of, of wax paper and then pour it into a cup and try and measure. So she could try and recreate what my grandmother did, which was completely impossible to do. It never, it never ever came out like grandma's the way we did that. But I was also thinking, well, what did I, what did I love about that? Well, what I loved was that I loved um, this experience of family, of being surrounded by people that we loved. And then after we would have this feast of seven fishes or more, uh, it seemed like many fish. As a kid, it seemed like an awful lot of fish. Um, we would go into the living room and we'd all sit around the fireplace. And I don't know if you remember these, but we used to get from our insurance man these little songbooks. They were white and they had little altar boys on them, and they were like singing, and they were songbooks of Christmas carols. This is, must, must be a very East Coast thing because nobody's nodding here. But we had, we had stacks of these little books that came from the insurance man, and we'd sit around the living room and, and we'd sing Christmas carols. Now, I don't, want you, I don't want you to feel or think anything angelic about this. Um, there was not um, 
a note of musical talent in my family, not one. Um, my, I, had, I had an aunt who was deaf. I had another aunt who was deaf and mute. Um, and so all of these people singing kind of sounded like a baseball bat in a trash can <laughs> filled with cats, OK? It was, uh, but everybody was really just singing out because it was Christmas. And oh my god, it was amazing that the police didn't come. It really was. And so, um, and the other thing that I really remember about Christmas this year that struck me is one year, um, I remember I, I had just gotten my license, so I was old enough to drive, and my mother said, uh, here's $20, buy a Christmas tree after school today, and we'll decorate it tonight. OK, that sounded like it. And I thought $20 was an extraordinary amount of money for a Christmas tree. So I'm thinking about this all day long, and I thought, you know, I bet I could go into the woods behind the house and find a tree. And we'll have an old-fashioned Christmas like they used to do in the old days. So I get all dressed up, and I get the saw, and I go out into the woods across uh, behind our house. And I found what looked to me like a nice little Christmas tree. I thought it was just great. And so I saw down this tree, and I bring it home. What I had not counted on was that outside, things don't look as big. And when I got the tree in the house, it was enormous. It was just enormous. It was as wide as the entire living room and only stood up about halfway, like half of it was bent over. But I thought, I can make this work. I can make this work because, because the house smelled great. The house smelled terrific. Um, and so I kind of trimmed and sawed, and I got the tree in a stand and, and got this all together. And my mother came home from work and had an absolute meltdown. She did. She was just out of her mind. She couldn't believe I'd done this. Where were people going to? Because the tree really did fill the living room. It was enormous. I had it wired to the ceiling. <laughs> and, and my mother said, I just, I, I can't even say another, I remember, I can't even say another word about it, which was remarkable. <laughs> and she said, just get this tree out of the house. Take the $20 I gave you and go buy a tree. I was wrecked. I was just crushed. I thought, this turned into be the best story of Christmas this year, though, that, that year I was growing up, because everybody had to hear about how I brought in a tree that was bigger than the living room. And I remember it as a really good time. Uh, <laughs> so which brings me to the point is, I think we all have to ask ourselves, what is it that makes Christmas valuable? What is it that makes Christmas meaningful? What is it that needs to be so for us to feel like this was a really worthwhile experience. Because whatever that is for each of us, and I know it's different for all of us, somebody it might be gingerbread, and somebody else it might be the presents under the tree kind of thing. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, I think the important thing that we recognize is that whatever it is that makes it meaningful, that fills it with heart for us, that we take responsibility for creating that. Because that's what we teach in Science of Mind. We don't teach a philosophy of potluck, well, whatever the universe brings me, I guess I'll take it. What we teach is that we are conscious co-creators in our life experience. We co-create with God all the time by, by what we're thinking and what we put out and what our intention is. So this necessarily means that we stop ourselves if we don't like what we're thinking, if we don't like the things that we're doing, if we don't like what we're imagining for ourselves. You know, if, if you have Christmas pasts that were wonderful, if your holidays have been great, that's fantastic. Good for you. I'm, see, you've created it. You can create something equally as wonderful again. And if holidays are not like your favorite time of year, then this is an opportunity to say, but, but I'm in charge of creating it the way I want it to be. What would need to be in place for it to be really meaningful, for it to be spiritual, for it to have heart, for it to really have significance? You know, because our thought is creative, you know, if we continue to think what we're thinking, we're going to produce more of what we've been getting. And that may be good, but maybe not. You know, we're putting those causes into motion all the time, and they're going to produce the corresponding effects. That is the science of mind teaching. You know, so the material world, this outer world of effects, rearranges itself to accommodate what a thinker, you and I, want. And it does so as the thinker is doing the thinking and deciding, right? So we are in the process right now of creating holidays that work for us. This is why it's silly to be jealous of anyone else's good which I know we live in a place where there are always people who have more. 
Always people who have way, way more. Now, I think that's fine. That's their consciousness. But it's silly to be jealous of anyone else's good. Hey, if that's their consciousness, they've done the mental and spiritual work to have what they have. And you say, well, well, I just don't think so, and therefore I'm jealous. And it's like, well, that's the wrong placement of energy, if I tell you. You know, it's, it's just off spiritual principle. It's much better to see that good and just say, wow, look what they've created. That's fantastic. That's for me. That's the important part. That's for me. Because that shows us if somebody else can create that, if somebody else can have that experience, that is also available in the infinite mind of God for us. Right? Gee, they have a wonderful relationship. That's for me. Gee, they have a beautiful home. That's for me. Gee, they have a job that they seem to really love. That's for me. This, I believe, is our divine heritage. Besides, God is infinite. Think about that. Infinite. Infinite God. It's not like anyone else got the last of the good, and now there just isn't any more. You know, I can see the headline now. God announces good all gone. Right? <laughs> Sorry, there won't be any more. You know, that's ridiculous, right? Our subconscious mind knows nothing about procrastination. It acts instantly on all of our conscious mind decisions. The subconscious just receives the impress and starts to set about creating that. It's been creating. It's been attracting. It's been revealing. Now, am I giving my subconscious mind, though, the message that I'm not enough? You know, or that I'm not good enough, or that I'm not lovable. If I am, that's wrong, and we've got to stop that kind of stuff right now. God did not make any mistake when you were born. No matter what anyone else has ever told you, or no matter what you've even told yourself, God does not make mistakes. You know, we want to reach out to, to a greater expression, right, to a greater ideas, and contemplate them as being so, and deciding that they, in fact, are so. You know, what, I'd say, where do we reach for our greater ideas? You know, I don't know where you find your inspiration. It may be that you meditate. It may be that you have particular books or scriptures that you go to. You know, but ultimately, we're reaching within our own being to that place of infinite God within us to call forward some greater idea, some greater expression. You know, because it's not out there. Something out here might reflect it, but really, it's within us. So I think in Science of Mind, what we do as students of this teaching is we try to stay prayed up. You know, that we want to bring a good spiritual consciousness to everything that we do. That, you know, we fill our spiritual bank account on a regular basis, right? And what we're after really is some sense of connection with the something greater. This is why the inner work that we talk about all the time is so essential, and no one can actually do this for us. We have to take the time ourselves to be still that we want to cultivate a conscious awareness of the presence. You know, like Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Or maybe a more modern way to say that is I am one with God. That's it. I am one with God. And we want to have time where, where we're not thinking anything in particular. You know, I don't know, but I know that God, the love and wisdom of the universe does know, and I'm just going to be here and see what that has to say to me. I think that's incredibly powerful, because this is where great consciousness actually comes from. Now, we can lose out on a really great experience because we listen to the opinion and the limitations of other people around us. Have you ever done that? I certainly have. I took other people's word for it when I should have just gone forward and had my own experience. You know. Um, the opinions of the race consciousness around us are not what will cause us to progress. They, the opinions of the race consciousness around us will cause us to be exactly where we are right now. You know, out of, out of their own fear or limitation or discomfort, people will tell you not to try. You know, because, why? And they always say, well, I just don't want to see you get disappointed. Right? You know, they, they will tell you why you can't be happy you know, or, 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 or what you probably have to have, or why things won't work out. But, you know, it's, it's always interesting to me how liberal people are with their limited consciousness. But they're not as liberal with their abundant consciousness as far as saying, yes, I believe that's possible for you. Yes, I'm in your corner. I know you could do that. You know, because our mind is the birthplace for God's intention, you know? We are here to duplicate the nature of spirit, you and I as emanations of God. To be godlike, and that means that we are here to be expressing the qualities and the attributes of the infinite spirit. So, you know, 
Forget your neuroses. This is not the time. Forget the inferiority complex. There's no place for that here. Those are all too familiar negative patterns for so many of us. Believing you are not much doesn't do a thing for God or for you, you know? So, because whoever says, wow, I'm really miserable. Gee, I feel close to God. That's not what people say. <laughs> It's, ju it's actually just the opposite. Our mind is a center of divine receptivity, creativity, and activity. So how will I know if God within is speaking to me or if it's just that voice of what I call my evil twin, you know, the one that's always setting me up? You know, because God within will never frighten us. The, the voice of God within will never make us feel bad or guilty or worthless. The voice of God within is always affirming life, is always affirming the abundant life. You know, because those other things, those just, they just do not exist within God's nature. Remember also that I think God is about ease. I have spent a lot of time, I don't know about you, I've spent a lot of time trying to force things, feeling like um, uh, pushing the boulder uphill, you know, but, but God is about ease. God does not struggle. God just naturally flows. So this doesn't mean that we don't have to put some effort, some energy into things that are important to us, because of course, absolutely we do. You know, but it's not all about struggle either. You know, there's a place where we put our effort in and we do our spiritual work and then we allow things to unfold. Because I think new ideas happen when we're receptive to them, when we want them, when we're willing for them. They're not going to happen if we decide we're content with, with things as they are, even though silently we say, but I'm not really happy about how things are, but I should just keep my mouth shut because I think it could get worse. You know, that's, that's not science of mind at all. Um, I don't mind just getting by, people say, you know, but, you know, I don't mind being sick all the time. I don't expect much from life. That is not our philosophy. That is not our teaching. And why that is so is because that really limits God. How? Because God is life, and that life is abundant, and that life is in you, and that life is within me right now. And so life is lived in the here and now. Life is always for a greater expression of itself. So conceive of more God expressing in your life. What might that be like? What would my life be like if God expressed in an even greater way? We say, well, I don't know, how, how will that happen? Well, God is always going to give us an idea because that's the way God gives to us all the time. An idea will drop in. I don't know what the idea will be. The idea will be, you know, hey, take a class or go be of service or, or read a book or do something you've never done. You know, like call somebody, investigate a possibility. If we have a material need, God will give us an idea to bring that need met into form, right? So here's what you need to do. Now roll up your sleeves and get going. That's how it seems to work in my life, that God usually gives me the idea and then I've got to take some action. You know, by right of consciousness, we attract people and information and situations that are necessary. So this is why we can say in all confidence, you know, everything I need, I know I have within me. Everything I need, because consciousness is what we need, and that's what draws to us. So God, the creative process, is seeking an outlet in us and through us and as us. And I think we limit ourselves in our life as long as we hesitate with this. You know, how we think and feel determines our experience of life. So look at this right now, considering the weeks of head. How I, how I look at things, how I feel about things, how I speak about things is going to shape this whole holiday month for us, all right? Paul in 1 Corinthians says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? God's temple is holy and that temple you are. I love that. You know, the Jewish people at Passover went to the temple and washed themselves before they could enter. And it was a symbolic act of purification, right? So the temple is right where we are. Right? Because God dwells within us as us. We are the temple. And what is our purification? I think, you know, and you won't be surprised, I think it's about forgiveness of ourselves and forgiveness of others. You know, believing that, that we are limited, that's got to be purified. That's a false belief. So any false beliefs that do not support greater life, greater love, greater peace, greater health, all of that has got to be let go. That's got to be purified out. How do we do that? Of course, through our spiritual practice. We cannot be in the place where God dwells if we've not purified ourselves with forgiveness and the cessation of those false beliefs, because that's, that's actually what's always holding us back. No escape from this, you know, if, 
if we desire a God-governed life, and I believe we do. We want God to hold a bigger presence in our life, to be an even bigger light, to be a bigger place inside of us. So I think, yeah, we are prayed up. We are ready, and this is what we have to tell ourselves as we speed toward the holidays ahead, that we are prayed up, that we have a consciousness that is ready for whatever life presents to us. And the shopped out, up, shopped out part, well, I leave that up to you. You know what that is for you. But because we have done the spiritual work and we've looked within, and we've looked within, and we've looked within, we are convinced that it's all right here where we are right now. I know you have everything you need within you to make this the best holiday you've ever had. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward for a moment now, recognizing that we are filled with infinite loving spirit, that this is the truth about who and what we are. We are emanations of the Most High God. And so not only are we one with God, but I know further that we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And in this awareness of our oneness with God, I speak the word for each and every one of us here that yes, in fact, we are prayed up. We are a spiritual consciousness that is ready for all that the holidays bring to us. I know that we remember that we are connected with God, that we are connected with all people everywhere, and that love is the order of the day. So we let that love of pure spirit that is within us emanate out from us to touch all people everywhere, to touch all experiences of the holidays for all people. Nothing and no one is left out. So we speak our word for our family members, our parents and children, all of those we love and hold dear, our church family, and we say God is right where they are. We surround them with light and love and know that they are lifted up in consciousness in a way that makes their life better. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in so that all people everywhere are blessed by this energy of prayer. So we see a light emanating out from our heart touching the hearts and minds of people everywhere around the globe. Again, nobody left out. We bless our church. We bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. Because truly, on the inner plane, we are all connected. We are all one in the mind and heart of God. So I give thanks that this is the truth right here, right now. I give thanks that we are blessed, that there is raising up for everyone and with an open, gracious, full heart, I release this word into God's perfect law. And so it is, together we all say, Amen. Amen.